Welcome to the Leaders of Lasting Impact podcast. I'm Matt Pohl, your host. I'm pleased to be joined today by Kimberly Weefling, who is the founding member of Silicon Valley Alliance. That's a bit of a mouthful. But maybe we start off with what is Silicon Valley Alliance? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Silicon Valley Alliances is a bunch of people who work together for many years through an agent in Tokyo. That's how we got started. And then over the years, the agent kind of went away, but we said, hey, we love working together. Let's keep doing it. So we put up a website, put our faces up there. And now every year we add people who are committed to transformational change the way we are. And uh, we work with them. <laughs> that's awesome. And how long did you say that's been in existence? Oh my gosh. Well, I started working with some of these folks 16 years ago. Uh, but the Silicon Valley Alliances, maybe it was six years or so. And, uh, you know, it sounds better, doesn't it, to hire Silicon Valley Alliances than Kimberly Weefling? Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Silicon Valley on top of anything. It's like, uh, you know, butter butter frosting, right? Of course, everything <laughs> tastes better with that on it. So Absolutely. Uh, People outside of Silicon Valley, they they come here like, Kimberly, I'm only here three days already. My brain is changing. And, and they think it's just the center of innovation. It's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, here, we don't have failures. We call them prototypes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the language, right? So oh, Well, you don't call sushi raw dead fish. That's right. There, that, that's a good point. That's a very good point. So how how did you get into um, consulting, advising businesses in the first place? Wow. Yeah. Well, in 1995, when I was still working at Hewlett Packard, uh, I said, geez, why don't I start my own business? And so I put up a website and printed some business cards and started telling people I had a business doing career coaching. And they believed me. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I just started doing you know, career coaching for my buddies at HP, they're, we're getting laid off, quite honestly. Hewlett okay. Packard back then, they were laying people off. And I'm like, I'm pretty good at finding jobs. I had seven different jobs in 10 years at HP. So I started my consulting business when I was still working at HP. And it wasn't until six years later that I fully, fully went full time. And I pivoted more to what I'm doing today. Okay, that's, that's cool. Um, was there any particular kind of decision point that made you say, well, I, I don't want to be in the big corporate environment anymore. I want to be on my own, do my own thing. Well, like uh, over 60% of people in the U S and around 80% of people in the world, I hated going to work. <laughs> I mean, employee engagement, everybody knows now from Gallup's research, right, employee right. engagement is so low. I mean, the best companies have about 70% of their employees engaged, meaning they come to work and they really care. But the U.S. is the country with the best engagement in the world, and it's around 35% last time I checked. Can yeah. you imagine? And I mostly work with Japan, which has 6% engagement, which went down from 7%. How can you go down from 7%? <laughs> so I didn't like working for someone else. I, I was so unhappy going to work every day. I just wasn't a fit for that. Look at me. Look at me as a personality. Oh, my gosh. This is me, Matt. Okay. This is okay. me. And at HP back then, they hired everybody the same Myers-Briggs type. Right. ISTJ engineers and I was a physicist but I was like this kind of physicist <gasps> excited <laughs> <laughs> so I said I want to have my own business someday and so I started dreaming big <laughs> okay well that's awesome yeah I I would see that you could uh uh color outside the lines when it was came to your time at HP that, that I agree that that doesn't well, some of those guys you know a lot of it was engineers and I I was leading a product development team and R&D at one point leading uh the development of a next generation mass spectrometer hardware software firmware and I would go in and I would look around at the room of 12 people and say should I wait for the other women to arrive just kidding I'm the only one you know I mean and and literally one of my uh people on my team this engineer comes to me and says, Kimberly, talking to you is like talking to a blowtorch. <laughs> I'm like, I thought I was exciting. So it wasn't until I finally met my Japanese colleagues where they said, Kimberly, you are a passionate sensei. Yeah, I'm not hyperactive. I'm passionate in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. 
It sounds like uh, you work with a, a wide range of business sizes. We're focused on more small, mid-sized businesses, but tell, tell me kind of the breadth of companies that you work with. Well, actually, I have helped to start over a half dozen small companies besides my own. I, For example, one of the guys who worked with me at HP, I laid him and myself off at, at some point, and he said, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start a business. So you know, I said, hey, why, I'll help you. And I started helping him with one business. I said, you know, I don't think it's going to work. Then he started another one. And I'm like, you know, it's fun working with you, but that's not going to really take off, in my opinion. And then he started another business. And I said, Andy, this is going to work. Embeddedworks.net. It was Internet of Things before Internet of Things was a thing, right? Okay. And so two weeks later, I talked to him and he goes, well, I quit my job. And I'm like, what do you mean you quit your job? Well, you said the business was going to work. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. So uh, I've been helping him for the last 22 years, off and on. He doesn't need much help, okay? But he grew that business to $3 million a year in revenue. And he kept it going during the COVID crisis. Uh -huh. And uh, $3 million a year revenue. Now, I own 5% of that company, and I've never seen a penny after my $2,000 investment in his company. But what an exciting adventure to yeah. be on, right? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Uh, when you're working with businesses, um, what what kind of area do you focus on? What kind of challenges, common challenges do you see in enterprises that you have kind of a unique way of helping address? Yeah, well, you know, my background is uh, education and physics. Okay. I have a master's in physics and a bachelor's degree in chemistry and physics. And I don't think I took more than one class in seven years of college about human skills. And then I go to work and I'm like, oh my God, I should have studied psychology. <laughs> So I was the worst. I mean, I wrote my book, Scrappy Project Management, which is actually translated into Japanese by Nikkei Business Press. And in it, I tell all these stories about what a horrible human being I was to work with. I could get anything done and people wouldn't want to work with me again. So uh, I finally realized, ooh, I need human skills. So now after many, many years of studying myself and improving my own way of working more effectively, I know that people are the center of it. So what I do in our work shock therapy learning labs, we turn managers into leaders. There's a difference. I, I go around the world and I say, hey, raise your hand if you like to be managed. You know, 2000 people in an auditorium in Bulgaria, no one raises their hand. And I'm like, do you guys understand me? Is it a language problem? <laughs> no, Kimberly, we don't want to be managed. Nobody yeah. wants to be managed. And then we turn groups of people into true teams. So if you think about it, what's the difference between a group of people and a real team? Hey, you know it. You've been in both, right? Right, right. <laughs> right. The dynamics are totally different. That's right. And, you know, I actually worked with one group of people where the, the top guy, the president, it wasn't a huge company. It was like about six or 700 people. And uh, I asked him, hey, if you were going to do something that was going to totally destroy your company, would any of your people tell you? And he's like, probably not, Kimberly, because he was just so scary and mean, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I try to help these kind of businesses, these kinds of leaders understand that you've got to take responsibility for your impact. And if you want to get results, you better understand that you're talking about people and processes, not just products and technology. Because that is what you need to be successful. The three P's, people, process, products, not just the products. Right, right. Uh, with that in mind, do you, do you focus on process as well? Or is it primarily that the people P of that trifecta? I started off on the process, project management. Because here's what I noticed, Matt. I was leading product development projects, hardware, software, firmware, combinations, liquids, gases, high voltage, high vacuums, all kinds of cool stuff. And at the end of project, you may know they do something called a post-mortem. Sounds right. terrible, right? <laughs> a post-project review. And we talk about all the lessons learned. And Matt, you know what I noticed? 
They were always the same. How can they be lessons learned if they're the same? And then I found a website that had a, you could download a document where you could just check off the things you did wrong. You yeah. can check them off again at the end. I was like, why can't we make new and more exciting mistakes? So I decided to, uh, you know, write project management book. And I was teaching in project management certificate program in UC Santa Cruz extension at that time. And I got really into the processes. And without the people part, without the so-called soft skills or what my engineering colleagues call touchy-feely crap, none of it will work. <laughs> so if anybody out there is listening and you think the human skills are soft skills or touchy-feely crap, wake up because the top causes of failure in teams are completely related to that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's intriguing. Um, when you... Uh, are the methodologies that you use, uh, are they your own solutions? Are they collaborative with other folks in your alliance? Um, obviously, you've been, you're a lifetime learner, clearly. So I'm sure you've pulled from a variety of sources. But, right. you know, do, do you feel like you have a solution of your own? Or is it kind of this hybrid? Well, so the project management book, Scrappy Project Management, that's my collection of my insights from my experience. Now, the leadership and the team stuff, I use 30 years of research from the Leadership Challenge, Barry Posner, Jim Cousins, Santa Clara University, 30 years of research in over 70 countries about what really works, you know, yeah. the behaviors, not theory. If theory worked, Matt, nobody would be fat, you know, eat <laughs> less, exercise more. Hey, thanks for the theory. So I look for what really works, and that's 30 years of research on leadership behaviors, and then the Gallup research, the Gallup 12 on employee engagement, the 12 questions people need to say yes to, it's not rocket science. Unfortunately, smart people prefer complicated solutions. Now, even this, this is what I love to use. Stop, think, organize, plan. Because if you just start doing stuff, you get some result. But if you do a little bit of planning of what's the purpose, the goals, the stakeholder analysis, you actually can quadruple. Four times greater results if you stop, think, organize, and plan. Big why purpose, big who, stakeholder analysis, who cares, who can help you, who's impacted, and the big what, the goals, and the measures of success. You get 80% success rather than 20% success according to the Project Management Institute's that data gathering. Now, so this stop, think, organize, and plan, I wish I had created it. But I'm going to tell you, I was walking around the streets of Tokyo one day and I looked down and I picked up this pen and it said that <laughs> on the pen. And I'm like, that's really good. So I started using it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I did make this one up myself, though. Fail, you know, uh, fear of failure, uh, avoiding planning, instinct to compete and learned helplessness are some of the biggest causes of failure in teams. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don't tell my clients I... about that thing on the pen on the ground thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sure you have lots of good stories. So maybe, maybe you can share one or two of specifically, again, more in that small to mid size yeah. business kind of uh, environment of where you were able to go and have a lasting impact on the people, on the organization. Can you share one or two yes. of those? Yes. So uh, I work with a lot of little, small startup companies, anything from a single founder to a few people who are trying to get stuff off the ground. I volunteer with Founder Institute, for example. And then I've helped businesses grow over the years. The problem is they grow, but they can't scale. Right. For example, my one friend, uh, she started a business based on a piece of horse equipment that she had designed that cures basically an incurable horse issue. And she was so struggling, you know, on the side to get this business going. And then she finally gets an order for 50 of these things. And she doesn't have enough money to buy the raw materials and pay to have them built. Mm. So, you know, I mean, you got to be planning not just to grow, but to scale. So get the line of credit when you think you don't need it and be prepared for success. Um, the other thing I did just last week, as a matter of fact, there's a group of six people here who are working on an AI and sort of blockchain business. 
And they said, yeah, we're a bunch of smart people and we you know, love this business, but we don't really feel like a team. So I got them over at my house in my living room for four hours. And I started off by saying, why don't you just talk about who you are? Build relationships, build trust. It's the number one cause of failure in teams, by the way, because they, they don't take time to do this. And then we spent the rest of the time imagining the future without any evidence it's possible and not knowing how, because super smart people, they want to rush the solution. It's like, right. stop, think, organize, plan. There's no point in figuring out how to do something when you don't know what it is you're doing. Right. So in four hours at the end, they emerged with this clear, vivid image of the future, which was visionary and inspiring. And they don't know how to do it, but they're so committed to making it happen and they know they will together. So that's just four hours, Matt. That's what can happen. If you have a team, you got to get people together to get to know each other, build relationships, build trust, and build a shared vision of that future. Well, that kind of fits maybe into my next question. And that is, you know, just some basic advice for any owner of a business, leader of a business on, you know, just some of the basic things that you could help them with. Do you know, start doing this, stop doing that, you know, something right. like that. Well, I think we'd go back to uh, both the Gallup 12 and the leadership challenge guidelines. So the leadership guidelines, for example, it's the number one thing is you have to be the way you want your people to be. So if you as a leader say one thing and do a different thing, they will not listen to what you say and okay. you will totally lose credibility. That's the number one thing for leaders. And of all of the behaviors of leaders that are the best leaders in the world, the least practiced of the five key areas is to encourage the heart, it's called. Reward, recognition, appreciation, thanking people, gratitude. It's free. It costs nothing. And yeah. all you need to do is be really specific. You can't just say, thank you. You need to say, hey, here's what you did that I appreciate. Here's how you did it that I found impressive. Here's why you did it that inspires me. And here's who you are that I admire. Now, that is from a book called Extraordinary Influence. And that's way better than saying, thanks. Yeah. yeah so, so that's, you know, I would say the number one thing you could do after modeling the way, being an example of the kind right. of person you want your people to be, is to appreciate them sincerely and specifically using the what, how, why, who framework. Okay. No, that's, that's awesome. Um, as you look at, um, I don't know, the most common or the clients you like to work with the most or have the biggest impact on, yeah. Uh, what are some of the challenges so that if somebody's listening to this, they would say, oh, yeah, I, I'm feeling that, I'm experiencing that. G give a few of those uh, concepts for us. Well, the people listening, if they are the people who are doing this evil stuff, they're going to be like, well, that's not me. But the people who are suffering might recognize it. Uh, it's called being a boss hole. Did you know, Matt, there are books called boss hole? Oh. Mm -mm. oh, oh, it's a whole word. And you don't need to read the book. You just buy the book and place it on your desk facing out where your manager will see it. Right. Uh, but this, this is related to something called power poisoning that uh, Professor Bob Sutton at Stanford University. I know him personally. He wrote Good Boss, Bad Boss. He wrote the No Asshole Rule. He wrote The Knowing Doing Gap. Basically found that when you get power and when you're like the founder of a company or the CEO or president, you have that position, power, and that title, you change. And, you know, you end up getting more positive feedback because people are afraid to tell you the negative stuff. And uh, like one CEO said, the day I was promoted to CEO is the last day anybody told me the truth except for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, uh, they have lower impulse control, uh, think of their own needs more than others, have lower empathy, and think the rules don't apply to them. And what he asked in his very scientific way was, do we just promote these jerks or does power change people? Oh. And he found without a doubt, as you well know, power changes people. Right. So if you are in a position of authority and you have people on your team, you know, employees who with a spouse who doesn't work, a kid in college, a mortgage payment, they're not going to tell you the truth. So you need to find ways to get honest feedback. And if you look at, you know, the behaviors in detail about leadership, the one that's the least practiced in the world 
is asks for feedback about how me as your manager is impacting you <laughs> because yeah. people don't know how to ask for feedback and they don't know how to give it. And, and, and think about it, Matt, feedback can be positive, right? It could be positive and appreciative. Um, but if your boss comes up to you and says, uh, hey, Matt, uh, please come into my office. I want to give you some feedback. Are yeah. you expecting a positive comment? <laughs> no, human brains yeah. need like 10 times more positive feedback than negative for them to feel equal. So we really need to find ways to get feedback. And there's some tool that I use called the feedback starfish that was created with me and my team, where you just tell people, here's the kind of leader I'm committed to being for you and this organization. Please help me. And then anonymously, you gather what's working, you know, that I should keep doing or what's not working and I should stop doing or I should do less or do more of. And you get people to give you that feedback. Uh, and I did that with a, a $3 billion startup, <laughs> the president and founder of the $3 billion startup. He grabs a flip chart and he runs out of the room and he puts all of it into a spreadsheet. He was so excited to finally get some honest feedback. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, that's that's an interesting dynamic. And I would say many of our audience is in that position where they have the authority, whether they're the owner or the CEO. And you're right, it changes, it changes the dynamic of their relationship with everybody else. And it can change them. Right. It can change yeah, yeah. how they view themselves and that can be positive, but it can also be negative. So, yeah, yeah those, those... You know, people are not always open to it. I mean, this big, uh, huge startup that's 14 years old that I was helping the founders a few years ago. No, they grew it from tiny to huge. And I could see some of the challenges that they were facing. So the husband was the president, the wife was the CEO, and I tried to help them a little too much. And they're like, and no, thank you. <laughs> because at some point, you know, sometimes the business outgrows you. And right. that is really tough when you're a business founder and owner and the business outgrows you to gracefully bring in someone who knows how to grow and scale beyond what you're capable of. It takes squelch your ego and do the right thing for your people and your organization. That's the toughest. Yeah, no, that's, that is, that's a hard, hard transition that, um, it's hard to recognize because you want to take it, you know, it's still your baby kind of a thing. But yeah, one of the lessons I learned as a father is that I can't teach my sons everything they need to know, that they need mentors as well. And that's kind of hard to hear even as a father. But I would say that's that's very much parallel to being a business owner. Well, you know, it's a team sport. I mean, look at soccer teams. They have 11 players. I mean, you can't do everything and know everything. And at some point, you need to put somebody in the position of CEO or president who understands how to navigate to the next phase of your growth. And I've helped a couple of organizations move from the founder being the president to the founder being in some other role that was better suited. It did not always go well because the founders are not always open to that. So I would say at the very beginning, think about your succession plan. If you're wildly successful, do you really think you're going to be able to be the CEO of a $3 billion a year business? I, I personally think it would be smarter to bring in somebody who understands that and you take a different role. Right, right. Okay. Well, this has been a, a very energetic and lively conversation. I appreciate you bringing your personal energy to to this podcast. Um, um, there you go. If somebody, <laughs> wants, if somebody says, hey, you know, my organization uh, and me personally, maybe, you know, could could. Uh, use some of your special sauce that you bring, uh, some of your your decades of experience on what would be the best way for them to to reach out to you? You know, if they want to just send me an email, kweefling at gmail.com, my first initial, my last name at gmail.com, just send me an email and mention the podcast. Of course, I'm always happy to have an initial conversation, no obligation, no cost, just have an exploration. If I'm not a good match, for them, I can usually find somebody who is because I have a huge network of amazing people in Silicon Valley alliances and in my consulting buddies in the Silicon Valley and beyond. I would be delighted to support 
And sometimes it's just a matter of having a thinking partner, right? Someone just wants to talk to me for half an hour. Fine. That might be all they need. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's awesome. So again, if you want to reach out to Kimberly, she's at K Weefling, and that is K W I E F L I N G. Yeah. F as in fun. At, at gmail.com. And, um, uh, We'll put a link to that email in our podcast notes, so you'll have that available. Take oh, another thing, on. Matt. Matt, just tell them read my book, Scrappy Project Management. It's only a two and a half hour read. It's irreverent. It's funny, and it will tell them most of what they need to do to make sure they fail for new and more exciting reasons. Okay. Well, it sounds like the book is totally different than your real personality. So. Um, <laughs> Okay, Kimberly, I really appreciate you coming on today and uh, being part of this podcast. And I appreciate our get our audience joining us. And I hope that you'll join us for future podcasts at Leaders of Lasting Impact. Thanks.